evening, good morning, and thank you for joining me on another episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. I am your host, Sharifa Hardy, and I don't know about you, but I have the best time hosting these shows. We're well over 200 episodes, and it seems to just get better and better. I learn from all of our guests. I laugh with our guests. Many of our guests have had orders and clients, and we just share so much. So it's very important to me that you do what I always ask you to do, and that is to go out and be an evangelist for the Roundtable Talk Show. I'm pretty sure there's someone in your circle, someone in your network, maybe someone in your house who needs to hear the information that we're sharing on the show today. And if you don't share it with them, how will they learn? We're talking to entrepreneurs, we're talking to business owners, and we're providing them with information that will help their business, but also help their life. So while you're going ahead and sharing the show with your friends and introducing it to them, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first guest. And our first guest is Maria Dykstra. Maria is an author, speaker, and marketing technologist. She spent 14 years at Microsoft helping Fortune 100 brands create exciting marketing campaigns. But something was missing. In February of 2012, she left her dream job to become an entrepreneur. Since then, she turned Trey Digital, the agency she founded, into a global brand. Maria built a strong global network of partners, became a top business advisor, and a leader of several top organizations. Good morning, Maria. How are you? Good morning, Sheriff. I'm doing fabulous. How are you doing? I'm excited to have you here. And the people couldn't see it, and I couldn't really read it in my voice, but dream job was in quotes. <laughs> And I would think the same thing. There are millions and millions of people who would dream of working for Microsoft. But for you, you just weren't feeling it? Well, I loved my entire 14 years. So it, you, you were talking earlier that some people know their entire life what they wanted to do. I had no idea. I graduated high school at 16 and I wanted to go learn languages because I thought that's what I wanted to do. And I'm, I'm from Russia. So I spoke Russian at that time and I thought I wanted to learn languages. And my parents, being a traditional Russian family, they said, you have two options. You can go work for a year or you can go to a business school. And so I considered my options. I went to the business school. I graduated at 21 with my MBA. And then I met my husband and then landed in the United States. So my first job at Microsoft was on the call centers. I was picking up the phone and I was saying, thank you for calling Microsoft Product Network a hundred times a day. Clearly not the dream job. And then <laughs> I accidentally found a job in advertising. And at that time it was 2000. Nobody knew what advertising was. Microsoft didn't think about advertising as a core business. Bill Gates was saying advertising on Microsoft properties over my dead body. But there was a job, it was a shift manager. It's like, hmm, I'm gonna try it because call center is clearly not what I wanna do for the rest of my life. And I landed in advertising. At that time, we were putting GIFs and JPEGs on the servers. You know how it's just, that was the advertising. We ran a prop twice a day when the ads went live. We had, I have many different stories I can tell you about the wonderful things we accidentally did, like unplugging the server that took the entire network of Japan down. So the ads went <laughs> down the entire place because the janitor decided to unplug the server. Uh, but it was exciting. I loved it. I grew with that business. I worked with every single Fortune 100 company. We ran their campaigns. We placed ads into Xbox Live. That was the first ad, the interactive live ad that happened. I actually worked for four years building the platform. So I worked with Google and advertising. I worked with the industry to create advertising standards. I loved it. I, I learned so much, but I was burned out. I was sitting in front of my computer realizing that I cannot do this anymore. So my partner who quit Microsoft a couple of years before me, he said, why not quit? Let's do our own agency. So we started a consulting agency in 2012. And I knew nothing about entrepreneurship. I knew I had no network outside of Microsoft. I actually coming from a traditional Russian background, I thought I was going to work for Microsoft until I retire and then I'll retire and do nothing else. But so it was concerning it was scary it was crazy but I absolutely loved it and so we from 2012 from two people we grew an agency so we were one of the first people that realized that remote what network was really a way to go so our agency is global our agency is on four continents I have people in different places our clients are in all the different continents I have Southeast Asia we have clients in Europe we have clients all over the U.S. We really embrace the digital network. So what we do today, we work with brands who are trying to get uh, known online. So we help create a digital strategy in the system because there's so many things you can do on social media. You know, you can copy and paste and you can spend your whole day 
responding to DMs and writing content, but that does not necessarily get you to where you need to be. It doesn't build you a business. It may not get you clients. So you can be spending 24 hours a day working, building your strategy, but not delivering anything. So my passion is really helping businesses, big and small. We actually work with Fortune 100 clients again. So I got back into my safety net and comfort zone. Um, but I also work a lot with the entrepreneurs and businesses and startups to help them create that marketing fundamentals that will get them working, their content working for them to create, to get clients, their content working for them to get known, for their content working for them to create the platform. So that's, that's a little bit about me. That's you in a nutshell. I love it, Maria. We're going to come back to you, but I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest, Mr. Joe Mall. Joe is a speaker, author, and commitment consultant. Joe is a certified speaking professional, the speaking profession's highest earned designa designation, and an international measure of speaking excellence held by less than 20% of all professional speakers worldwide. Joe speaks and writes about commitment in the workplace. Joe is the former head of learning and development for one of the largest physician groups in the U.S. As CEO of Joe Mall and Associates, he is on a mission to fill workplaces with better bosses and he just recently launched his first podcast good morning joe how are you good morning sharifa i am thrilled to be here with you thanks for having me today thank you for joining us tell us a little bit about yourself well sure i actually have been uh in front of audiences for every job I've ever had and has always had a knack for designing and delivering programming in a way that was engaging and interesting to people. Uh, and that combination of creativity and teaching has really been at the center of everything I've done for years. And so, as you mentioned, I was uh, head of training at a large healthcare organization for a lot of years and uh, would probably still be there doing that to this day uh, if they hadn't reorganized the entire HR structure of that organization. And uh, one day they uh, came in and on a cold February day like today and said, we are centralizing everything. Your entire unit has been eliminated. We love you. We think you're an asset. We want you to stay. We're going to try to pay you the same. We're just going to move you over here. Uh, and over here was not the right fit for me. And so mm -hmm. I, I kind of had a moment of crisis because I loved the work. Uh, I had been doing every imaginable kind of training that you can think of. I was doing new hire onboarding and orientation, uh, service excellence and patient experience training. Uh, but my subject matter expertise was always in leadership development and management training. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had gotten a lot of wonderful feedback over the years that I had a gift for it. And I started to think, well, if the folks here continue to be thirsty for the kind of work I'm doing, maybe there are a lot of folks out there who are thirsty for the same kinds of things. And so I jumped off a cliff uh, with a <laughs> two and a half year old and a six year old uh, at home uh, and started my business uh, back in uh, 2014 and uh, 2013, excuse me. And uh, have been going strong ever since. Really uh, have gone out into the world to do a couple of different things. Uh, started a boutique training and consulting firm that focuses on teaching leaders how to be better bosses. Because we know that if you want employees to care and try and give their all, the most influential factor is the quality of the relationship they have with their direct supervisor and his or her ability to meet a pretty complex set of emotional and psychological needs. Uh, and so my business for the, the past seven plus years has been a, a pretty even split between professional speaking and, and authoring some books and this boutique training and consulting agency. Uh, and so we have clients in about 25 different U.S. states, and we serve them in a variety of ways uh, through training, coaching, uh, and consulting. So uh, that's, that's my story, and I'm thrilled to be here. That's powerful. Now, I've heard that people do not leave companies. They leave managers or they leave supervisors. One of the things that stood out in your bio is you kept using the word commitment, commitment, mm -hmm. commitment. And I, I've seen, I've been laid off eight times. You know, that's part of my journey, right? And so I've seen that not many companies have that same commitment, the loyalty that we used to have. Right. I think like Maria mentioned when she expected to retire from this company, but that ability isn't there. So for supervisors or bosses, what are some of the things that that they can do to have the commitment from the employees. 
Yeah, there are a handful of conditions that that leaders have to create in order to get that emotional and psychological commitment. The good news is we don't have to rack our brains to figure out what they are. There's a lot of research out there. Uh, and I know you're going to introduce Tracy in a few minutes. And I think we play in similar sandboxes around employee engagement and whatnot. Um, but there are a number of things that leaders need to do to cultivate commitment. Uh, we know that they need to connect uh, the work that people do to a powerful purpose, a cause that illustrates the difference that they make in the world. We know that leaders need to connect a member members of the team together so that they can foster group cohesion and team and team spirit and feel a sense of belonging. Uh, they have to have their ideas and opinions solicited and considered and listened to. We know leaders need to help employees align their talent and skills and gifts to the work that they're in and to be advocates for their own professional career arc uh, in the years down the road. So these are just some of the things that we know leaders have to uh, devote themselves to if they want to create an environment where you get the most from people while they're there. Absolutely. And like you said, Joe, we're going to go ahead and introduce our next guest, Miss Tracy Benson. Tracy founded On the Same Page LLC in 2002. They create and implement strategies to communicate with and engage employees in large mostly Fortune 500 organizations, mainly during some kind of large scale change. Since many of these scenarios are both personally challenging and highly stressful, she found herself coaching and advising her senior executive clients a lot. She discovered that it's incredibly helpful to have someone to work with who deeply understands business, change, and people, and who sits outside of the organization. Good morning, Tracy, how are you? I'm just so excited to be here, Sharifa. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. I love your background on the same page. And I think that's what, as companies and organizations and business, that's what we want. We want everyone from our employees to our customers, everyone to be on the same page. Absolutely, we do. And, and I'm, I'm excited that Joe actually spoke before me because I do think that there's a tremendous amount of synergy between the work that you do, Joe, and the work that I do. And I mean synergy in the way that we learned it in science in seventh grade when it was a good thing, yeah. not in the way that companies use it today, yeah. which is so that they can shed people. <laughs> they do that. And I noticed that like, there's no synergy here for us. So we got to let you go. Exactly. <laughs> or, there, or companies come together and they're going to figure out their synergies, which is corporate speak or corporate code for, and a whole bunch of you are du doing duplicate work, so we don't need some of you. So yeah, it was uh, one, of the, one of my personal missions as well as my teams over the years to help eliminate that corporate jargon and really speak in language that, is, um, that makes sense to people. Yes. Tell us yeah. about your company, Tracy. What's your passion about? Oh, gee, thank you so much. So I, I grew up on a diet of communication and engagement. And so much of what Joe, you know, you were talking about, I'm nodding and yes, 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 we did that too. And, and Maria, we have similarities in the sense that, you know, I started my company um, at, a, at a, an interesting time in my life. And, and I know, Joe, you mentioned this too. I, it was 2002 and I had just been reorged out of a large global consulting firm. And I was smack in the middle of getting divorced. And I had kids that were one in five. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh gosh, what am I going to do? Long story short, on the same page was born, um, grew, grew, grew into a, uh, before, people were talking about virtual organizations. Our people are all over the country. Our clients are all over the world. And we've never had an issue with that. So, um, so my passion is, you know, for many, many years, a lot of the work we were focusing on had to do with large scale transformational change, either across an entire global function or across a, an entire organization. And our work had always been understand what the change is from the business perspective and what they need, what the business needs to accomplish in terms of its objectives. Um, translate that into language that employees could understand, discern what they needed to know and do differently, as well as the same, and then engage them in that. And 
it all sounds great and and we love that work but over the course of years of doing that i mean like decades i began to think to myself this is such an uphill battle this and then it dawned on me one day you know this change thing change happens in every single one of our lives but it's one of those things we grow up not learning how to do. Like back in the day, some of us are old enough to remember checkbooks. I know young people <laughs> don't have any idea what I'm talking about, but like they didn't teach you how to balance a checkbook in high school. They also don't teach you how, we don't teach people how to change. And so I've been working very hard for the last couple of years on a program, which I'm just, that is my passion, on helping individuals and organizations master the skills and practices so that they get good at change. I, I love it. And I just had to laugh when you, when you mentioned the checkbook, because as a result of COVID, some of the organizations that I do business with, I go down to their office and, and work with them, but COVID, their office are shut. And they're like, Sharifa, send us a check. I'm like, I don't have a check. Like, I, I haven't seen a check since the 20s. I don't know. But times are definitely changing. Tracy, I'm going to come back to you, but I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest, Mr. Randall England. Randall offers keynote talks, consulting, professional facilitation, executive education, books, articles, and advanced training services to people in management, managing projects, and working on project teams. His approach includes behavioral, technical, business, leadership, influence, negotiation, political conflict, and change management aspects that create an environment for project success. He was senior project manager at HP, has an MBA, BSEE. Good morning, Randall. How are you? Good morning. I'm just doing really fine and love uh, working and talking with people of, of kindred spirits and and a real care for sharing ideas and insights and, and making a change in the world and uh, among the people that we inhabit this planet. Oh, I love it. What well, stood out to me, and I've done, like I said, over 200 episodes, is somehow, some way, there's a common theme. So how do we get someone from HP and someone from Microsoft and people who are focused on the same issues on today's show? I don't know how it happens, but I'd love to hear your story more about you, Randall. Sure. I think I discovered early in, in my uh, life that I have a, a passion for project management. Uh, in fact, I was out in the field with GE Medical for a while doing some service and I said, this is reactive. Uh, this isn't my thing. I like to be proactive. I like to plan things. I like to make things happen. And when I discovered the profession of project management, I said, wow, that's my thing. And so I was able to uh, transition. We, we did the largest installation of, of equipment uh, when I was in the field uh, in the Bay Area and uh, said, okay, what do I do next? Well, I set up a project office to run everything for the district. And then once I kind of uh, got that in place, I like being a pioneer. I like to kind of start things new and when it becomes more routine, that's time to move on. So I, I was able to join Hewlett Packard in, in the Bay Area. And, and loved it. I was uh, had the opportunity to meet Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett and wonderful people. Worked for Lou Platt when he was CEO and he endorsed my book. And it just, I, it was a wonderful practice field to be able to work with a great company, great people, and be able to do project management, being in some project offices, even have some marketing experience. And I discovered most of the time, I'm not the smartest person in the room. But I can work with very smart people and I'm very process oriented and, and facilitate and can take a group of people who can uh, might have all kinds of different opinions across mm -hmm. the board, but can bring them towards a consensus and, and get something done. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to uh, work in program management there. And at one point uh, we brought in a, 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 I read a book about uh, project management as if people mattered. And I brought that author in Dr. Robert J. Graham in and, and uh, he's a culture anthropologist. And we wound up, uh, when I was in a corporate project management initiative, he said he'd like to write about it. I said, well, what about if we did it together? And so that was really our first book, Creating an Environment for Successful Projects. And we really put everything into the pieces of a puzzle that make for an environment. Uh, and it goes just beyond the technical side of things. It really has to do with 
how people operate together. Is it a toxic environment in terms of, I'm not talking about physically, but I'm talking about the relationships among people, or do we create a green environment where people trust each other, they work with each other, they have fun together, and, and you know, they can disagree very effectively. And so that's what I tried to do with that book. And then we uh, teamed up with Alfonso Bicero, who's actually from Spain, and we did, dug into the whole role of project sponsorship. How do you achieve management commitment for project success? And then uh, after a while, we said, gosh, we, we really focused a lot on the upper management, the teams, the environment. Uh, what about the skill set of project managers? Because the thing that I found since I had a marketing background, I had a R&D background, I had a field background, and I loved reading a lot of business literature. And for the longest time, I was like, God, this is great stuff, but what do I do with it? And, and then when I became an internal consultant at HP and was training people and operating across organizations and project program, portfolio management, uh, this is great. And, and so I said, well, how can I put all this together? Because we're tapping multiple disciplines. We need to negotiate. We need to manage conflict. We need to influence people. We need to deal with conflict and change and market and, and uh, even fun, putting fun on the agenda. And so that's where we, uh, Alfonso and I, wrote about the complete project manager. And this is being able to integrate all of these skills together. And I think integration is the key word. This is how we create value not by just doing the routine things, but by integrating all the different disciplines, all the things that people know, the, the people who are on this, this panel here today, to be able to integrate our different skill sets, our different points of view, and be able to, you know, we could solve the whole world's problems, if you will. And, and, and I don't mean to be arrogant, but I think I can work with almost any team and help them to come together. Not because I know the answers, but because... If we put a process in place where we're saying we're clear our objectives, we understand, we accept the people who are in the room or working with us together and can facilitate them through whether it's conflict or being able to become more cohesive, that they can, uh, maybe they're lacking a vision statement. I love working with people to, to come up with a potent, powerful vision statement. And it's not easy. And it takes a lot of wordsmithing, but by the time we get through it, it becomes very energizing and being able to make sure people understand what their purpose is, why, they, why they're there, and be able to go through and, and create these green environments that we're talking about. And so these are things that uh, uh, come up with criteria. How are you going to, to select projects in your portfolio of projects? All of us have a portfolio, whether it's a personal portfolio of things that we're doing, or it's an organization that has a uh, uh, strategic goals, uh, but they don't select the right project to support them. How do we get criteria in place that can support the, the strategy and make it happen? And these are things I'm passionate about. I love working with people to see that light bulb come on when they finally get it. So I can, I can, I can help them create that, that, that sense. Uh, I, I love to help people change their thinking. Uh, I can tell every time you mention a word fun, you just light up like you just <laughs> fun. And you you know, I, 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 interviewed, mm -hmm. I interviewed a lot of people in the government one time when I was in Washington, D.C., and I heard the pain. It was awesome and awful. I mean, it was it was awesome, the people, but it was awful, the environment they had. They're in pain. And it's like, you know, it shouldn't be that way. Life is too short to not be having fun at work. And when you're having have fun, fun you're work. more productive. I've definitely have fun at work. I enjoy my job. This is what I do. It lights up my world. I'm passionate about it. Now, Randall, you mentioned toxic environment. Joe, I know you talk about, you call it drama, the mm -hmm. drama at work. Let's talk about your, your book, Joe. Sure. Um, I had the privilege of publishing my second book not long ago called No More Team Drama, Ending the Gossip, Clicks, and Other Crap that Damage Workplace Teams. And this was really born out of a lot of the, the training work I was doing with leaders all over the country. When we would go in and really get deep into what are the conditions that you need to create in order for teams and people to thrive, and we would put the list of things on the board that we need to be working on as leaders, 
One of those is something I mentioned earlier, fostering group cohesion and team spirit. And over and over again, it came up as the area with which most leaders struggled. They said we would talk a lot about actively disengaged employees, those folks who are disruptive, who act out their unhappiness at work, who pull other people into drama. And so I decided to go do a deeper dive on that topic and spent a couple of years looking at all those aspects of team dynamics, looking at what leads some teams to become high performing, close knit, no drama work groups, while other teams, sometimes in the same building, become high performing, close uh, become toxic, disruptive, disengaged work groups. Uh, and that was the genesis of the book. We identified four things that teams have to get good at together in order to reduce team drama. We call them courtesy, camaraderie, conflict, and cause. Uh, and if we can give uh, both leaders, formal leaders, and team leaders, you know, those folks who have influence on teams, uh, some insight into focusing on these things, uh, you can have a pretty dramatic change in the kind of culture and in the quality of the interactions that take place in the workplace. You know, Joe, when I was working with one team that wanted to become more cohesive, I interviewed them individually beforehand. And I asked them, when, would you, when were you most energized and most excited and most in the flow? And they all talked about stressful situations when they're really trying to tight deadline and, and they're working very intently. And so when I get them all together, I really said, you don't want to eliminate those things because those things really get you going and be able to support them and realize this is, you know, it might be stressful when you're in the middle of it, but man, this is when, when you're at your most highly productive. Yeah, and that's, that's actually that fourth C, that, that idea of cause. One of the things that we see in the research and what we see anecdotally, just as you mentioned, is that when people have something that is truly worthy of their time and attention and effort, all of the other noise and junk and BS that tries to come into the workplace, it gets pushed aside. Uh, when I do conference keynotes and when I do workshops, before the pandemic, I would always ask the question, has your team ever experienced something that forced you all to come together and rally together to get through it? And what we heard before were stories of, well, our, our EMR, electronic medical record crashed at the office and we didn't have it for two days, or we had a power failure, or I was in Houston right after the hurricane a couple of years ago. Uh, nowadays, of course, everyone is dealing with the pandemic and have, has had to rally together for an extended period of time. But what you see is that when people have that clarity of cause, these other things don't matter as much. And so we don't end up devoting our precious energies and resources to them. The problem becomes that we're dependent on those stressful situations. We're relying on glitches and tragedy and mayhem mm -hmm. to help people ascend to that higher level of performance. When what we really need to do as leaders and in workplaces is just come up with such a clear cause, an idea of why we're here and what we're doing that stirs the soul. And that's not a mission statement. It's not the, the company slogan. It's the difference our work makes in the lives of others. It's a, sing a single sentence or idea that acts as a suitcase case packed for, full of all the stories that the people who work there can tell about the ways in which their work makes a difference. When we start bringing that to the surface and giving voice to that over and over again, then why so-and-so said or did this with the other person and what we're whispering about in the corners, it becomes trite by comparison. Absolutely. Tracy, I see you nodding away. Go ahead and jump <laughs> in here, Tracy. For sure. Thank you. So um, I, I think that it's, you know, when the pandemic first hit last year, I was working with a pharmaceutical company and it was one of the questions that we asked, I had a number of one-on-ones with the direct reports of a, a senior executive I was working with. And one of the questions that we asked is, when in your tenure with the company, have you felt the strongest sense of collaboration? And they all, talked about, you know, something that they were doing now. And, and so that's so true that, you know, that, that I think sort of crisis can propel. And we worked with another organization many years ago, actually it's a, uh, an athletic, you would know that I'm not gonna name the name, but it was, it has to, they're one of the top athletic brands. And it became clear, it was actually said we work best when we're under the wire because we're all about winning. We're all about, you know, winning the competition. 
And so, you know, it's important to know that, but I think the sort of my take on all of this is, while I agree with everything that you all have said, I also feel that individuals are, uh, should be held responsible for building some skills around participating in a proactive way around change. So, Joe, you talked about this sort of, you know, sense of ur sense of uh, what they're there for packed in a suitcase, and it's really compelling. And so if everybody shares that, or even if a critical mass shares that, because you're never going to get the full 100% of your population, right? But if you get a critical mass of people who at least share that and add in the skills for developing you know, embracing and adapting to change in a proactive way. Now you've got fire, you've got fire in the belly and gas in the tank. Right. So I like that fire in the belly and gas in the tank. Maria, you can't be quiet on the round table talk show, especially when I'm feeling good. We're talking about employees. I'm sure you got a whole lot to say about that. No, I do. I was wait I was just waiting to um just being polite. Thinking, no, I was thinking <laughs> about the difference between being in person because I spent my 14 years at Microsoft and the last two years I felt like I learned nothing but the skill of managing up and politicking because you had to make sure that with all the re reorganization, the mergers and everything else, that you're not lost in the shuffle. And I feel like it's completely different. And that's what I'd like to hear an opinion. I feel like it's completely different in the world where it's, everyone is remote. There is no sense of drama. We're not at the water cooler discussing what happened last night and what the person wore or what they talked to each other. There's no place for rumors because it's, it's all very transparent. Our communication happens through the digital platforms. We, we are all aligned with the common goal of serving the clients and building and celebrating successes. So I, and it could be just my jaded world of the agency and I'm not seeing things, but but in the remote space, there's not a lot of that drama. There's not a lot of that communication. And in fact, I had one of my clients who is a Fortune 100 client said, you know what, I'm going to escalate it to my VP. And I said, I don't care. You know what? It's your structure. We don't have a structure. So I think that's another factor of where it's remote and the world is so different. And I wonder how that will be changed in the companies because a lot of companies are adopting this remote approach for their employees they might the twitter is going that way and t-mobile is doing a lot of that work and a lot of microsoft um, is adopting a lot of those policies so i wonder how the whole world of entrepreneurship and the change management will be different just because we're no longer in that stuck in the environment where we're with 10 people in the office and we see them day in and day out because we don't have time for that we don't have time for rumors we're focused on building our client successes creating it. And actually, I think the compensation it works very different. So there's that satisfaction of growing the client and building the structure, but the compensation is at least in our agency is very clearly aligned with the successes because everyone in my company shares financial rewards. So we have, we close the new client, then everybody who participated in the project gets reward. We lost the client, everybody felt that. And so there's never, I, I have not experienced any questions from my team in eight years. And yes, some people leave, some people get managed out just because they're not a good fit for us. Um, but at the same time, I feel like there's a, not as much of that drama, not as much of that con concern happening. Cause I left, I couldn't, I could no longer work for my manager. I had two Two kids and the environment of people going to the club or to the bar after work was just not working for me because I, I had to work and I had to take care of my children and, and I felt like I wanted to be working for myself. And uh, I think it's, it's the environment has changed. So I'd be curious to hear if you see some of that too. Well, let's get you some answers then, Maria. We'll, we'll get an answer from everyone here today. But I will tell you, I've been working remotely from home for years. And one of the things that I always talk about is the one thing that I miss is the coworkers. Because I would go to work just so I could have lunch, so I could sit down and find out what was going on <laughs> in everyone's world. Like, that was right. the whole reason I was there. Like, what are we talking about? What's going on? What, how's your, your life? How's your love life? How's the kids? And then I'm yeah. ready to go home. So, Tracy, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, it's, it's, I, you know, we also work primarily with Fortune 500 companies and, and some Fortune, you know, 200 companies. And uh, what I'm finding is that so much of what the employee experiences today um, has so much more to do with the company's culture than it does have to do with whether they're remote or in the office. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting thing, the company culture, a lot of leaders will have 
an idea of what they want the culture to be. And that is something they may talk about, but the, and, and in many cases, the culture at, in actuality does match what the, the words that are coming out of the executives or the leaders mouths. In many cases, it doesn't. And the culture is so strong as to um, tremendously dictate the way that people behave. And I'll give you two very super quick examples. So this one organization that um, we work with, again, is a global um, organization, very, has an incredibly intense performance expectation culture. And nothing about that changed in this pandemic. And so there were actually meetings that I was on, on, on this kind of a platform where I was observing and I, maybe I was presenting something, but sometimes I was observing. And I, after the phone call, after the meeting was over, I called my client, the senior executive and said, you've got to call so-and-so because he's, he's on the edge or she's about to break mm -hmm. down. And, and that's because the performance expectation, which th there's nothing wrong with the performance expectation culture, but in the age of, you know, the last year that we all went through, it, it really got um, kicked, kicked around a lot. Now, there's another company that we work with. Interestingly enough, their culture is they're, they're all about excellence and they're all about compassion respect, empathy, and caring about their people. It's, they care a lot about their people and they make, you know, they, they talk about it, their behavior absolutely demonstrates that. And over this past year, I don't want to say they over-indexed in that direction, but they, they really emphasize that. And so a year later, we're a year into this now and, you know, companies have to continue to survive. Now they're saying, oh, Okay, so how do we bring back in the performance <laughs> aspect of expectations of the culture? And we had a long conversation about those two things are not mutually exclusive, right? So, you know, um, I think company culture, and we, it, we led a series of webinars, a partner and I last year with executives from, you know, you name it, PepsiCo, uh, MasterCard, um, a, a ton of companies, IBM. And they talked, they all talked about how their culture really did dictate how they were handling the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think the stronger um, uh, component is the culture over remote or not remote. Love to hear what others. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Randall, your thoughts? Yeah, when I uh, was working at uh, this corporate project management initiative, uh, the thing I really loved about it was the, the teamwork, the working with the people, and we developed action sheets, and they were knocked down bloody sessions almost, uh, but we got them perfect, and, and I learned so much from that. But I think when the, when the, when the team became uh, more static, that's when, when I left the company and, and went out on my own. And now I do seminars for the Project Management Institute, and I love doing in-person seminars when you get 20, 30 people in the room and from all over the world, if you will, and, uh, you know, I just love work with them. But now we've had to do it virtually. And so at first I kind of resisted, but then I've done the four-day seminar virtually. And I also teach uh, online classes for the Northeastern University on, on leading, on managing uh, technical projects. And I found that virtually can be very helpful because if we make it interactive, not be a lecture, not be just talking, but being able to interact among each other and, and do things that make people interact with each other, I think sometimes virtually they can be more engaged than they are in person. Because, uh, you know, for instance, in the, in the university class, if they don't post and, and share some of their experiences, they don't get credit. Whereas sometimes in a classroom, you can be quiet and passive and just go along with everybody else. So I think it's, it's very important that as a facilitator that we do things to engage people, to, to really understand what motivates them, what's important to them, that we act to them, ask them questions. I think when I work with the teams on consulting engagements, I go around and, and ask the people about what's going on. And uh, anytime a, a company has some challenges, I go ask the people, how would they solve it? And I'm probably the first one that ever asked them. 
you nobody and so oftentimes an upper management uh, bothers to ask their own people what are the things that we can do to be more efficient and effective and and meet these goals and so i think it really has to do with with how uh, the culture gets uh, engaged how the leaders act uh, i've worked much like some of you have described with some people that some of the the managers are very enlightened and it's just delightful and their teams are productive and they they're they're believing in continuous improvement and others who just want to be in control or in power and 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 create those toxic environments and so it's it's a shame that some of that still exists but i know it does because i i hear from a lot of my students uh, how a lot of changes are handled very poorly they don't ask the people they don't tap the wisdom of the crowd and the crowd being the people in their organization they don't tap that uh, as well as they could and others uh, have had some managers who are very into the mentoring and being able to work very well together so it, there's a world of difference and there, there's a lot of opportunity for all of us to work with how do we create these environments that uh, are delightful to work in and and how we can create value not just produce things or routine but creating value and, and constantly push the edge of the of the uh, rainbow, if you will, and, and, and be able to get to that pot of gold. That, that's, yeah, that's very that's important. Really, Go ahead. I'm very sorry, true. Maria. No, it's very true. I was just uh, hearing the word that virtual is good. And I, I think it is good because it forced all of us to learn how to use technology and have those face-to-face -face conversations. Because I had my record of working with somebody for six years and never seeing their face because we worked with global people. And now I don't think we can go for a week or two weeks without really realizing. So I know I know exactly how my clients look like, exactly who my partners are, I've seen their face, but before the COVID, I haven't seen them. So I, I think it's adopting this new technology, but it also puts a strain on facilitator to be to be interactive, to draw people who are quiet. So it's, a, it's a, always a pendulum that swings on both sides. But I, I love virtuals. <laughs> I mean, it's always good to meet in person where you get to know the people and then you can be more functional virtually. I mean, my co-authors in Spain and Alfonso and I have done these books to send it back and forth and we meet periodically to talk about things or, or, or do some seminars. But I think being able to have both in person so that you know them and then be able to work virtually to, to keep that communication going. Absolutely. I want to ask Joe, Joe, do you feel that there is less drama in the remote yeah, world? I, I think Maria's point is is accurate. I think that when you remove proximity, you get some of that change when people aren't sharing the same space. And so we could potentially point to that as a benefit of remote work environments, but it also comes at a cost, right? We know that feeling like a, a part of a team and the, the, the camaraderie and the relationships of a workplace is an influence in retention, right? Uh, Sharifa, you mentioned, I miss the people. When you look at all the research and engagement, we know that for some people, not all, but for some, what's most important to me is that I like the people I work with. And I would maybe not consider a, a move or another job because of that as, a, as an influential mm -hmm. factor. And so it, it's a mixed bag. And I think it, it speaks to some of the skills that Tracy was talking about earlier, that amid all of this change, especially for folks who are moving into remote work environments, one of the skills that leaders need to start to develop quickly is how do I build camaraderie in remote environments? Um, one of the things that I've heard over and over again over the past year is we feel so disconnected. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we aren't um, as uh, plugged into one another as maybe we have been in the past. And so th there are things that leaders need to, to spend time doing and to connect people together because it also depends on where each of the individual contributors are coming from. You have some folks who, you know, if we think about where we get our energy from and we use that kind of traditional model of introversion and extroversion, we have some folks who love the remote environment because they get their energy from working solo and isolating and retreating into their mental cave and, and, and unpacking and doing the work. And we have some other folks who need to do the interactions to sort things out and to problem solve and, and, and to refill their gas tank. And so the, the leader needs to develop the skill to produce some camaraderie and to help people find things in common because we want that connection. It produces some really wonderful things that impact the organization um, and remote environments make it harder to do so. Absolutely. Now, Maria, we answered your question, but I'd love to hear from you. What are some of the things that you have done in your organization to build camaraderie? Uh, that, that's that we're still building it. It's, it's a, uh... 
definitely a challenge for us because we started before the technology was out there in the digital world. But some of the things where it's transparent communication because uh, every person in the company that works in the project is aware of what the project goals are. So we're all part of the team that are aligned with the common goal. And I think that's where people were talking about that they, when you're in a crunch, then you work better mm -hmm. together. So it's, a, it's not always a crunch, but there are always um, deadlines that people understand what's happening with those deadlines. They, they have full input. They understand if they fail the team, what the implications are on the rest of the team. It's never, it's never political because there are no promotion. We, we have a very flat structure in our organization. I feel removing that structure of promotion helps with the, eliminating some of the uh, potential drama that happens, but pe people participating, people get compensated appropriately. They also get celebrate the successes. And there's very tangible alignment between the success of the client and our success as the company. And that's where every time we work with the uh, brand that we take on to help and grow, I say, look, your success is our success. Because we can't, if you don't succeed, we don't succeed. And I really mean that because there's a immediate and there's immediate impact to the team members. There's open communication. I'm very direct, so I'm not. I'm one of those leaders who's not going to be sugarcoating it. Um, so if things are not working, I'm going to give specific feedback on things that are not working, and and people respond to that. And and I think it's also finding the people who are a good fit for the culture, because not everyone will be a good fit for our agency. I mean, there are some people who are brilliant. They're fantastic. They're fascinating. They will achieve great things, but they may not work for our agency, for our culture. And I think it's having that clear understanding of what the culture is and articulating it to people and actually clients too, because when we start onboarding the client, the first conversation we have is that this is our culture and that's how we operate. These are the things we'll be asking from you because it's not just us doing the work, it's the clients participating in the success and working together um, and having that transparency, I think that's what, what helps. It's just the, the clarity, the transparency, the direct communication, direct feedback, which is immediate, and then the real uh, tie into the compensation. Mm -hmm. Tracy, your thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because we had, um, as I mentioned, we started as a virtual organization back in 2002 and had a number and, and and Maria did many of the same things that you're talking about in terms of our structure um, in terms of we also put a really strong emphasis on connectivity that was really important to me as the CEO and to my leadership team and so we instituted several standing um, things that just always happened like you know for example we had a quarterly um, we had a quarterly video conference call, you know, back in the day it was WebEx and I know WebEx mm -hmm. is still there, but then we ultimately transferred over to Zoom. And, um, but on those calls, it was, you know, everything from state of the firm, here's, you know, here's our new business status, here's what we're doing, here's revenues, here's what we're, what we need. We always opened with the celebration of people, what accomplishments they had uh, produced and, uh, and achieved. Um, and so there was that there was, uh, we also did it for a while, we did a monthly and then some, it became semi monthly or every other month, um, a skill swap, where somebody on our team happened to have a, like an amazing talent or insight, or was super adept at something that would benefit everybody else It was optional, but we almost everybody showed up and it could have been anything from social media to, you know, um, how to create, you know, a, a, a project plan. Um, we also had, you know, it, sort of tongue in cheek a view from the from the corner office, which was um, an, a con an email from me every month that really was based on my personality, which is you know, I, I take many things seriously, but I don't take myself that seriously. <laughs> so, you know, there were a lot of mechanisms that we used to really embed that connectivity. And, um, and then ultimately, we also had a buddy system. So when new people joined our team, they were assigned somebody who was had already been with our team. And so there were lots of things that we did like that. But um, and, and, you now back in those days we did get together for an annual meeting once a year in the fall and um it was really really hard work and also really hard play <laughs> so that was important yeah important for connection 
It sounds like it. What I want to know, is there anyone who has seen or part of their company done anything deliberately different as a result of the global pandemic? I talked to some guests. They said, you know what? Our employees aren't used to working remotely. So we do this, we do that. Some, some people it's like every Friday is pajama day. Like they come up with different ways for people to feel. Joe, love to hear from you. You know, I think it's the intentionality of making more time for that than they ever have before. I think that's the the biggest difference. So there's a kind of X factor in team performance that we wrote about in the book around this idea of camaraderie Mm -hmm. that when you give people the chance to find things in common with each other that don't have anything to do with work suddenly we access each other's humanity in a completely different kind of way. If we figure out that we have a mutual love of running or we have kids the same age or we both love fishing, then now we have a a different kind of interaction. And when you think about both some of what Tracy just described and what Maria described, there are also opportunities to connect people together by asking them to walk in each other's shoes and and to see these are the challenges I deal with at work and this is what my role is here and these are all of the factors that influence how I show up all of those things together, both those like walk a mile in my shoes at work kinds of things and find things in common with each other that don't have anything to do with work, they dramatically increase the likelihood that when a blunder occurs or somebody messes up or something doesn't go right, that I'm gonna go and and instead of whispering with Maria in the corner about Tracy or making up a story in my head about why Tracy doesn't care, she's not trying hard enough. Instead, if we've done all that work together, it's much more likely that I'm gonna go, that's a good person having a bad day. And let me see if I can help her out and step up on that. And I think the, the shift to the global pandemic has forced leaders to say, we need to carve out more time for building camaraderie and helping people find things in common. And, and if you'll permit me, I, I'll make an observation about some of the things that we throw out there sometimes to build camaraderie because they're fun, but they don't always help people find things in common. And, and, and in workshops, I always use the example of happy hour, right? Um, I'm not anti-happy hour. If happy hour is your thing, go and do it. But I don't think we get to check the box next to it and call it a, a leadership supported tactic for building camaraderie on teams, right? Um, the, the, the litmus test for me is when people come out of that experience, do they have an opportunity to find something in common with one another that doesn't have anything to do with work? If we're doing that, we're moving closer to camaraderie. Absolutely. I have enjoyed this show immensely. I've learned a lot, laughed a lot. We had a lot of fun. Now, we are coming down to the last few minutes of the show. And what I love to do at the end of every show is just simply allow my guests the opportunity to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who is watching the show live, as well as everyone who is watching in the archives, and let them know what you want them to take away from your appearance here today. And we're going to start with you, Randall. I believe in uh, creating green environments, and I think one of the things that uh, I have helped people realize, whether they're working virtually or or in person, is that uh, you need to be working in your element. And I help people try to really find out what is their element. And and doing projects together is one way to build a camaraderie and, and be able to understand people. One of the things you can do is develop a political plan. And one of the things we talk about is a political jungle. And what animal are you? Are you a lion, a tiger, a bear? Are you a, a black widow or the, the mice? Or, you know, and it's a fun exercise as a way to, to do things together with people. I also help people realize that you can be a poo, a P-O-O. And <laughs> project offices are, are becoming more and more the, the vogue and are very helpful. Well, a project office of one, a P-O-O, is such where I don't have to get permission to do it. This is my thing. I can just do it. I can do it in stealth mode if need be. But I think uh, when I've mentioned that concept to some people, they light up and be able to realize I can do this. This is something I enjoy doing and I can be good at it and I can be very successful. And I'm hopeful that the metric uh, ultimately is your boss comes to you and say, how are you more effective when others aren't? And People saying I'm operating my element, I'm being able to make something where I can create value and, and be productive. And, and that's what I help to, to do with people and, and hope that this can make for a better world. I like that. Can I be a bunny? <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. I want to be a bunny. 
Rando, where can people find your books? My books are available from Amazon. And uh, my website is England PMC. So England P as in project, M as in management, C as consultancy. So englandpmc.com. And there's links uh, right there and, and about the books. And uh, probably almost any online bookstore will, will have the books. Fantastic. Thank you. Tracy, what do you have for us? Yes, I have um, some excitement about a program that we've just launched called The Three Essential Practices to Make Change Suck Less. <laughs> and it turns out that change really can suck less. But I have to say it sucks in the first place because it turns out that we're factory wired to resist it for our survival. So understanding this, we built a program drawing from neuroscience and psychology and elite athletic coaching and, and business uh, uh, operations, et cetera. And the three essential practices to make change suck less are MRI, mindset, resilience, and identity. And we're just absolutely thrilled to help individuals and organizations develop these skills learn these practices, in, integrate those into their daily outlook, into their daily behaviors, so that we all can jump into the driver's seat of change instead of sitting in the back or even in the trunk. And where you can find all of this is on the same page.com with hyphens. So on hyphen, the hyphen, same hyphen page.com. Of course, you can find me on LinkedIn as well, as well as the business. I'm Tracy Benson on LinkedIn. Thank you so much, Sharifa. You are so welcome. Thank you, Tracy. Maria, now what do you have for us? Well, uh, first, I wanted to say thank you to you, Sharifa, and all of the guests, because I've immensely enjoyed this conversation. I feel like it was a very dynamic discussion, and we found a lot of things in common. And being somebody who works remote for a lot of time, this is one of my opportunities to network and meet people and have a conversation. And in terms of what I want to have people take away is that I would like everyone who's an entrepreneur, a leader, a uh, startup, um, business owner, I would like for them to think about the power of content and the power of networking. Because really what we did today, we all created content. With you or being our fearless leader, it is a content. And the content doesn't have to be a blog. It doesn't have to be a book. It doesn't have to be a podcast. It's whatever it's comfortable and convenient for people. So get out there, start networking, start creating content. And that gets your business out that gets the word out about everything you do just just take the place and the platform that's comfortable find the leaders that will support you in that and get out there and don't be afraid we have the technology now um, to start start getting your word out because it's important for the world to know the brilliance of everybody we have not working in that hole in the dark corner of the cave and creating something and not sharing with the world just start sharing one bit a bit a piece at a time and um for us, we actually are launching a digital nomad conference. That's for people who are remote entrepreneurs who are looking to create location independent business and sustainable income from that. Not the person who sits on the beach and, and works on a laptop and can barely survive in some country that is very low income country, but it's for people who are looking to create sustainable businesses and processes. We'll be making announcements our second year running this event. And you can find a lot of that information on tradedigital.com and or on LinkedIn. I'm Maria Dykstra on LinkedIn. That we'll be posting all of the announcements and inviting people to network, participate, learn, create content. Fantastic. Thank you, Maria. Mr. Joe. Well, if you are someone's boss, congratulations. You are the topic of dinner conversation at other people's houses. And I'm not sure if you ever thought about it that way, but it's true. Uh, and it's true because you possess a tremendous amount of influence over what people think and how they feel about how they spend most of their waking hours. And as Sharifa alluded to earlier, we know the data tells us clearly that people don't quit their jobs, they quit their bosses. 75% of people who leave a job indicate that their boss is part or all of the reason why. And one of the things that we know is that commitment comes from better bosses. We know that when leaders show up and put people at the center of everything that they do and create certain conditions for people to thrive, not only do the people 
in the organization benefit. Not only do we individually benefit, not only does the client and customer benefit, but society on the whole gets better because we have people who stop dragging themselves to work and actually they come home at night feeling fulfilled. Uh, and so we, and we design everything that we do around creating these kinds of boss heroes. Our leadership academy focuses on creating these kinds of boss heroes. Uh, our uh, keynotes and workshops do so. And the new podcast that we just launched is focused on creating boss heroes. It's called Boss Better Now, and it's available wherever you listen to podcasts. It's a weekly dose of advice, humor, and encouragement for bosses everywhere. And it's designed the way a, a morning drive time radio show uh, would be designed. So lots of fun, lots of humor. My co-host and I, she's a, a professional executive coach, um, really try to provide a show that acts as food for the boss's soul. So uh, if you want to learn more or keep in touch, you can head over to bossbetternow.com uh, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you there. And Sharifa, thank you so much. I loved being a part of this today. And, and uh, like Maria said, it's a, been a really fun way to connect and meet some new folks and be a part of an interesting, uh, rich discussion. Thanks a lot. You are so welcome. I enjoyed the show immensely. I want to thank you all for being guests on today's episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. And I especially want to thank everyone who tuned in to watch the show live. Plenty of comments today in the comments section on Facebook. I also want to thank everyone who's watching this show in the archives. Like I always say, just because you didn't catch the show live does not mean you're not important. It doesn't mean we still don't need your support because we do. Whether you're watching this show two days from now, two months from now, two years from now. It doesn't matter. We still appreciate you. We appreciate you for sharing the show. But as always, I always say the same thing. Please don't just watch the show. Please don't just share the show. Please support our guests. Our guests are here this morning to help you, to support you, to give you information and resources that can help your life and help your business. So please support them. Their website link is in the Facebook post, but follow them on social media. Reach out to them, ask your questions. And when you reach out to them, please let them know. Sharifa Hardy says hi. Now, if you're interested in more ways that I can help your business, or maybe you want to be a guest on the Roundtable Talk Show, please visit my website at AskSharifa.com. Until tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Pacific, everyone have a safe and a blessed day. Bye now. <laughs>